Spoiler alert for the whole show, obviously. Set in the all-accepting past, Merlin is a show about Merlin. For those of you who don't know, Merlin is set in Arthurian legend, a time when King Arthur ruled over Albion, which is a nerdy way of saying England. There's a lots of stories about King Arthur, like the Round Table, the Holy Grail, and Monty Python. Merlin is an interesting show because it makes everyone young and good looking. Well, the writers also project their 2009 hipster fashion sense on Merlin, even though the year is like negative seven or something. But as BBC does with taking well-established brands and making them gayer, the relationship between Merlin and Arthur has been debated over being perhaps not as straight as some would like to think. I'll have you for breakfast! Merlin, the titular character, is the new guy in town. And as Merlin enters this new kingdom, he becomes apprentice to the court physician slash gay mentor slash exposition man, Gaius. He also has magic, which, according to King Uther of Camelot, is a bad thing. So bad, in fact, that he believes people should be executed for it. Along with Uther, there's his arrogant son, Arthur, and his kind of daughter, Morgana, who also secretly has magic and also turns evil. When Merlin and Prince Arthur meet, they don't like each other. At all. It's like the beginning of one of those high school animes that I uh, definitely don't watch and definitely wouldn't know anything about since I've never watched one. Never. To Merlin, Arthur was first introduced as some petty bully for a prince that liked to taunt people that were lower than him. Not a very good impression. To Arthur, Merlin was this random dude that challenged him. Needless to say, they didn't really like each other. Even though, according to Arthur... There's something about you, Merlin. And so our story kind of begins now, with Merlin attending a kingdom event with his friend Gaius. And he happens to save Arthur's life. As thanks, Uther decides to give Merlin the privilege of being Arthur's manservant. It really is like a romantic comedy. Meet Merlin. He's a lowly servant with big and magical dreams. Meet Arthur. He's a stuck-up prince. But now, after saving the prince, Merlin becomes his servant for life. Watch as these two riders start to become friends and maybe fall in love this summer. Merlin isn't happy about being this dude's servant. He doesn't like Arthur at all, so imagine his thoughts when he meets a dragon that tells him something outrageous. A dragon named Kilgara that tells him that Arthur is his destiny. Arthur is the once and future king who will unite the land of Albion. Right. But he faces many threats from friend and foe alike. I don't see what this has to do with me. Everything. Without you, Arthur will never succeed. Without you, there will be no Albion. Merlin can't take it. He doesn't believe that Arthur is somehow his destiny, and the dragon is giving him really vague answers to his questions. How can it be my destiny to protect someone who hates me? A half cannot truly hate that which makes it whole. Oh, great. Just what I needed, another riddle. That your and Arthur's path lies together is but the truth. Just give me a straight answer! I guess Kilgara's answers are just a bit too gay for Merlin. So, the question is, how is it that these two that hate each other become friends or, dare I say, lovers? It's complicated. At first, they don't like each other. But, do have a few things in common. First and foremost, they're both courageous and strong-willed people. They both have destinies that they feel are overbearing. Arthur to be a great king, and Merlin to have some role in that. All these things help them see eye to eye. In fact, by episode 4, they're already risking their lives for each other. When the weekly life or death situation is happening and Merlin was dying for poison, the only thing that could save him is this special flower that's guarded by this venomous beast. And Arthur wanted to take that risk of his own life to save Merlin, for a servant. Towards the end of the first season, 
Merlin and Arthur are faced with two goblet slash chalice slash fancy cup things. It's like, it's like the Princess Bride situation, except both of them are willing to die for each other, willing to poison themselves so the other could live. Even though they're self-sacrificial for each other, there's still a disconnect between them. There's the issue that Merlin is a servant and Arthur is a prince, and that they could never be friends. All right, I know I'm a prince, so we can't be friends. If I wasn't a prince... What? Well, then... I think we'd probably get on. Let's get it on. This is the source of their troubles. But over time, this will change. For example, ice sex becomes a big thing between them. Now that we've established that, let's take a look at the facts. Combined from a mix of Destiny and Arthur's overall good looks, Merlin eventually becomes attracted to Arthur. Romantically? Platonically? Let's keep that question up for our viewers. You could say that there is a bond between us. But we can't ignore the obvious here. Merlin has magic and Camelot is strictly anti-magic, which brings us to our sub-point. Throughout the series, it's pretty obvious that magic is a metaphor for being LGBT+, from just the overall exclusion to the death penalty. It gets in your face at times. What if magic isn't something you choose? Face it, Merlin, you're living a lie. I've always been taught that Magic is evil. And it corrupts your soul. You don't know what it's like to be an outsider. To be ashamed of how you were born, to have to hide who you are. Until then, we go unmarked in death as in life. It's not even I practice magic, it's I have magic. Merlin has to deal with that shame, while at the same time using magic to save Arthur's life and never getting recognition. He speaks out about his frustrations. Do you think I sit around doing nothing? I haven't had a chance to sit around and do nothing since the day I arrived in Camelot. I'm too busy running around after Arthur. Do this, Merlin. Do that, Merlin. And when I'm not running around after Arthur, I'm doing chores for you. And if I'm not doing that, I'm fulfilling my destiny. Do you know how many times I've saved Arthur's life? I've lost count. Do I get any thanks? No, I have fought griffins, witches, uh, bandits. I have been punched, poisoned, pelted with fruit, and all the while I have to hide who I really am because if anyone finds out, Uther will have me executed. Sometimes I feel like I'm being pulled in so many directions I don't know which way to turn. However, something about Arthur and the so-called destiny that surrounds him is so compelling that he is willing to put up with the persecution in order to serve Arthur. He becomes close to him, even with the servant and master divide. I willingly give my life for Arthur's. How brave you are, Merlin. If only it were that simple. What do you mean? Once you enter into this bargain, it cannot be undone. Whatever I have to do, I will do. His life is worth a hundred of mine. Even though Merlin is just a servant, he feels comforted by Arthur. When Merlin's one-time romantic interest dies, Arthur is there to comfort him. <laughs> Something's been upsetting you, hasn't it? Maybe. Was it when I threw water over you? <laughs> it wasn't very nice. It was a bit unfair. Like when you called me fat. Why was that unfair? Because I am not. I still think I need to get in shape. No! No, 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 no! I... That's better. Thanks. Even if Arthur can be an idiot, he at least cares about Merlin, and Merlin doesn't feel so lonely anymore. But then, something great happens. Yes, it is great. Arthur and Gwen fall in love. 
If you don't know, Gwen is this other servant girl who uh, works in Camelot and is the son of a blacksmith, is also a badass, and is local friend to Merlin and Arthur, and she's great. And although that may seem like a bad thing for a love-struck Merlin, it helps him believe that maybe Arthur can learn to love a servant. His relationship with Gwen gives him hope. Hope that Arthur can look beyond class and love somebody for who they are. The risks that Merlin takes for Arthur are questionable to other people. Morgos, the town lesbian, asks why Merlin does all this stuff for Arthur. You intrigue me, Merlin. Why does a lowly servant continue to risk everything for Arthur and for Camelot? You know the answer, but you're not telling me. Why? Come on. Time and again you put your life on the line. There must be a reason. I believe in a fair and just land. And do you think Arthur will give you that? I know it. And then what? You think you'll be recognized, Merlin, is that it? All this so one day you can be a serving boy to the king. No. There's something more. Even more ghosts, the town lesbian, can see that this isn't about recognition for Merlin. There's an underlying reason. Love. Don't pretend you don't want to. Through all these sacrifices that Merlin makes for Arthur, he begins to see him and Arthur as a special team. Like, he could do anything with Arthur. Except get a different haircut. I know you don't mean that, you're just worried. But you don't need to be. Look what we've got. What? You and... Me. Merlin. What exactly are you going to do? I'm going to be at your side, like I always am. Protecting you. God help me. Merlin knows that Arthur doesn't see this, and yet decides that he wants to fulfill his destiny of loving Arthur and being by his side. As we're introduced to new characters like Lancelot and Mordred, and Gwen and Arthur's relationship develops, this further influences Merlin to show all these guys how it's done. You don't have to sacrifice yourself. To save my people. I will take your place. You know, there's one thing I don't understand, Merlin. You're Arthur's servant, nothing more. Yet, time and again, you proved yourself willing to lay down your life for him. Particularly damning is how Merlin is willing to give up his principles for Arthur. For context, there's this dude called Mordred that is destined to kill Arthur. He's also one of Arthur's knights and friends at the time. One day Mordred is dying, and these folks called the Fates say, either legalize magic or Mordred will die. And Arthur, who at this point is actually considering legalizing magic to save his bro Mordred, asks Merlin for advice. If I do save Mordred, all my father's work will be for nothing. Sorcery will reign once more in Camelot. Is that what you'd want? Perhaps my father was wrong. Perhaps the old ways aren't as evil as we thought. So what should we do? He said magic. Could let Mordred die. There can be no place for magic in Camelot. Merlin, the most powerful sorcerer in the world, had to choose between his identity and his friend. He chose Arthur above a world where he could live freely, something that would help himself and countless others. When one values a relationship that much, there's something else going on besides simple friendship. With Uther's eventual death and Arthur's ascension to kingship, and the changes to their characters. Whatever the hell is happening in Arthur's head is a question worth answering. Let's look at the facts. When Arthur meets his future lover, he sees him as a peasant. 
and then when that peasant becomes his servant, that's all he is to him. As seen before, the class that divides them is one of the reasons that Merlin and Arthur have stated that they aren't exactly friends. But that soon changes. The first time that he starts being able to see servants as equals is when we get a beautiful human being called Gwen. When Arthur fell in love with Gwen, it showed Arthur and Merlin that Arthur was capable of loving a servant. There's something you want to say to me. Don't let me stop you. You don't have any idea, do you? About what? About how rude and arrogant you can be. This is my home and you are my guest in it. I know you are used to more luxurious quarters, but that is not an excuse to be so rude. You claim titles don't matter to you, but you behave like a prince and expect me to wait on you like a servant, saying it means nothing if your actions betray you. Would it kill you to say please and thank you once in a while? Thank you. Even when there is a class divide, that doesn't stop Arthur from willingly sacrificing his life for Merlin. Even if he's reluctant to admit that he cares for him, jeez. I mean, even when Arthur's talking about Gwen, it sounds like he's talking about Merlin. Just say it. I can't. How can I admit that I think about her all the time? <laughs> or that I care about her more than anyone? Arthur's strangely fond of the boy. How can I admit that I don't know what I'll do if any harm comes to her? I came back because you're the only friend I have and I couldn't bear to lose you. To admit my feelings, knowing that, hurts too much. And the comparisons to Gwen don't end there. When Gwen's bro, Elian, is gossiping with her about Arthur, he uses the fact that Arthur would rescue her, a servant, as evidence that Arthur loves her. I only hope Arthur can think of something. Arthur? Prince Arthur. I came with him. Prince Arthur of Camelot? Yes, Elian, Prince Arthur of Camelot. Why would he want to help you? Why shouldn't he? <sighs> Because he's a prince and you're a servant? He doesn't care about that sort of thing. He's, you know, chivalrous. Right. So he's like that with all the maids in Camelot? No. Yes. I mean... <laughs> hmm, so by those standards, Arthur is in love with Merlin as well. Or at least, cares for him more than usual. And I think slowly that care turns into respect. A small amount. Like saying, Hey, good job, but you're still dumb, so shut up and make me a sandwich, Merlin. I don't normally say things like this, but... You did a good job back there. You hear what I just said? Alright, maybe I should give you some kind of reward. What do you want? Some peace and quiet. Soon, Arthur's disdain for servants and people he thinks lesser diminishes. He breaks the code of his father and starts knighting people that aren't of noble blood. <gasps> Calm down, scandalous gasps of the Middle Ages. Arthur starts giving Merlin credit. He realizes that they're both brave, strong. They're living in a destiny that they can't escape together. That's significant. We'll defeat the Duraka. We will, Arthur, together. I oh, appreciate that. Yeah, you're a brave man, Merlin. And then the turning point. Ah, yes, the turning point. It's those things like the Battle of Saratoga and that point in 11th grade when you stop being emo that makes life interesting. And for Arthur, that is Uther dying. Uther, his father, is the one that imposed all these ideals on Arthur. The idea that magic is bad, a king must be strong and unforgiving, that a kingdom is more important than the heart, and that wearing the same haircut for 10 years is a good idea. But after there's no one else to impose these ideals onto Arthur, he starts to think for himself. That is, not without his friend's help. Arthur, don't let anyone tell you what to do. You said you are your own man. You have a good heart. Be true to me. He starts to realize that he doesn't need those old age ideas. He realizes that class isn't everything. And at that point where he feels the most alone, there's a moment when the camera makes this sneaky but powerful move. <laughs> he 
he looks at Merlin and realizes that he isn't alone. It's that first shot, that smile of reassurance that Merlin gives him. And onward, Arthur starts actually giving him compliments. And more importantly, fully reciprocating the eye sex. You have a very good servant. You're right. I do. A servant who's extremely brave. And incredibly loyal, to be honest. Not at all cowardly. When Merlin is presumed to be dead in A Servant of Two Masters, Arthur cannot accept that Merlin is dead. And the freaking king of Camelot goes by himself to look for a servant. Guys, this isn't a one-time thing. It keeps happening. Merlin, he knows the tunnels. He'll find his way. I'm going back. For a servant. Were you worried about me? No. I was making sure we weren't being followed. You came back to look for me. All right, it's true. I came back because you're the only friend I have and I couldn't bear to lose you. Really? Don't be stupid. And now we're getting to a, another development in the Gwen and Arthur relationship. Gwen is put under a spell by Morgana and cheats on Arthur. And Arthur is definitely not having it. He basically banishes her and gets more angsty than a bring you to life and in the end mashup playing at a Hot Topic. How can I love someone who's betrayed me? Wake me up! Wake me up! Eventually, Arthur gets out of his rut. With the dark and sweaty help of Merlin, of course, Merlin just actually makes up some elaborate lie about a stupid sword. It's not like that sword becomes important or anything. And it's important to note that, out of all the people in the world, Merlin was the only one who could help Arthur's spirit again. Even with Gwen back, something is changing in Arthur. When he was feeling lonely without Gwen, the only thing reassuring him was his men. And that includes Merlin. He says something interesting about his relationship to his men. And the fact that he says it to Merlin is telling. And you don't care? Only about my men. More than friends. More than brothers. No matter what lies ahead of me. I won't abandon them. As I know, they would not abandon me. I understand. <laughs> I wish I didn't. But I do. To say that his men, specifically Merlin, is more than a friend or a brother is leaving a lot of interesting different options. If it's not romantic, at least we know that the bond that Arthur believes he has with Merlin is more complex than just a friendship. The fact that maybe they aren't just friends is becoming apparent to Arthur. After this, there's an episode where Arthur revisits his dad in the vague and non-referential afterlife. And it's important to note that Uther is very angry with Arthur. I don't want my people to respect me because they fear me. Then they will not respect you at all. Your marriage should have served to form an alliance with another kingdom. You choose to marry a serving girl. I'm married for love. I love Guinevere. More than I can express. There are some things that are more important than love. Now, this will stick with Arthur. Even when he was most willing to accept magic, when Mordred was dying, this kind of solidifies the fact that Arthur shouldn't like magic. This probably influences when Arthur decides to execute Mordred's GF and accidentally cause a war. So Mordred is pissed that his love is dead and goes and tells evil Morgana that Merlin is actually a spooky wizard. So now that they know that fact, they go and plan for a spooky war. And so that Merlin doesn't interfere with Morgana's plans for victory, they take away his magic. Now naturally, when you're the king of Camelot going to war with Hot Topic wizards, you want to have your 2009 hipster friend at your side. But since Merlin doesn't have magic, and Merlin needs to go to the heart of magic to get his magic back, Merlin can't go with Arthur until he has his powers. I have an urgent errand to run for Gaius. Vital supplies that I can't obtain here. Vital supplies? Yes. It's not that I'm... No, no. Arthur. You know, Merlin... All those jokes about you being a coward. I never really meant any of them. 
I always thought you were the bravest man I ever met. Guess I was wrong. Ooh. Now, to get his magic back, Merlin goes to the Crystal Cave. When he gets there, he goes through the usual motivational and spiritual realization, as the cave tells him vague things like, You just gotta believe! Meanwhile, everyone back at Arthur's camp knows that Merlin is way too in love with Arthur to chicken out last minute. I'm not sure he believes you guys. I'm not sure I do either. I know how devoted Merlin is to Arthur. He would never leave him at a time like this. Not for me, errand. So Merlin communicates Charles Xavier style, in gayness and medium, and tells Arthur what he needs to know about the incoming attack, and that he is totally not a coward. And Arthur, after hearing Merlin's voice, leaves his concerned wife without really saying goodbye, just to listen and go see Merlin. And, um, with the power of love and magic, Merlin returns to his man and saves the day. Until... Arthur gets stabbed, but this ain't no regular sword, as it was forged in a dragon's breath, and will kill Arthur in a few days unless Arthur can get to the Washington Monument in three days. Thank you, Exposition Man Gaius. And Merlin is the one who has to take Arthur, but as this maybe is the last time that they're together, Merlin decides that this is the moment to tell Arthur. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I have magic. <laughs> I'm gonna use it for you, Arthur. Only for you. So, how does he react? <sighs> well, I'm guessing in acting terms, that's supposed to express Arthur's internal struggle. <sighs> to a man who's been betrayed by his sister, been called a failure by his father, and betrayed by Mordred and his wife. What does he do in the face of another betrayal? But Arthur realizes, nothing has really changed. He's quick to forgive Merlin, and when he sees that, even with his magic, it's just a sign of his devotion, of his love. Why are you still behaving like a servant? my destiny, as it has been since the day we met. And I also do this, because you're my friend and I don't want to lose you. Arthur isn't even concerned that Merlin practices magic, but rather that he lied. He doesn't really care about sorcery. He's seen the potential and good it has. He's just hurt because his friend lied. Why did you never tell me? I wanted to, but... What? You'd have chopped my head off. I'm sure what I'd have done. And I didn't want to put you in that position. And hearing that Merlin had actually feared him hurts him more than being lied to. Some men are born to plow fields. Some live to be great physicians. Others to be great kings. Me, I was born to serve you, Arthur. And I'm proud of that. And I wouldn't change a thing. Merlin, the person who has felt conflict over being subservient to Arthur, is now expecting that it's his destiny to be with Arthur, to support him in his time of need and be at his side during death. Arthur latches on to the same idea. All these years, Merlin, you never once sought any credit. That's not why I did. And Arthur begins to realize, with his abuse to magic people and the fact that Merlin should have received recognition, he starts to see Merlin in a new light, 
he sees him as hope, with love, and a reflection on everything he should have done. Maybe he thinks that Merlin should have been the one, and Merlin, with the idea of entangled destinies, already knows that. I don't want you to change. I want you to always be you. But Arthur realizes that it's over. Though Merlin, despite Arthur's complaints, does not want to do anything but proceed, Merlin, his devoted servant, can't let go. He doesn't want to see a world without Arthur, as if he had unfinished business with Arthur and he's just realizing that he could have a world with magic. After an encounter with Morgana, Merlin finally kills her, and his hope for the future is further solidified. But Arthur's giving up. With Arthur dying, Merlin's hope for himself and the future dies as well. Arthur starts to say his last words, and they're for no one else but Merlin. We all match you. I'll save my life. I can't. I'm not going to lose you. Just, just, just hold me. Please. I think that this speaks for itself. Wanting to be held by your lover as you die. Say, you're not going to say goodbye. No. Well, everything you've done, I know now. For me, a Camelot. For the kingdom you helped me build. You'd have done it without me. <laughs> Maybe. I want to say something I've never said to you before. <clears throat> Thank you. Isn't it telling that Arthur's last words on this planet are thank you to Merlin? After an entire life, the last thing he wants to do is thank Merlin. As Merlin holds the man he loves in his arms, he calls for Kilgara. Just as a final desperation. Even the dragon, the dude that advocated Merlin to kill a kid so that Arthur would stay alive, is now admitting defeat. But as Merlin is mourning over the fact that Arthur is dead, Kilgara gives words that Merlin will always hold on to more than Disney on Star Wars. Arthur is not just a king. He is the once and future king. Take heart, for when Albion's need is greatest, Arthur will rise again. And Merlin never forgets that. He sends him to the river, says goodbye, and Merlin never forgets. Even after Gwen has become queen, after hundreds of years, after the Beatles became the last significant British invasion, Merlin lived to wait for the day that Arthur would return. Now I don't know about you, but considering the fact that people have died from playing Pokemon Go, it's pretty hard to not die in hundreds of years. Just imagine the struggle, the arduous task of staying alive, all in the hope that the love of your life might one day rise again. If it takes forever, I will wait for you for a thousand summers. I will wait for you. While Merlin as a show was an interesting watch, and at times made the romance between Merlin and Arthur seem like a compelling and possible future, it makes me wonder, did the creators purposefully make a romance and never show it through? Did they accidentally create a romance? Let's take a look. While the creators have given half answers on whether this was truly gay, it's hard to declare whether the creators had malicious intent. Now for our viewers who don't know, queer baiting is a phenomenon where a show will bait that characters are LGBT. 
but never follow through on their bait, causing no representation for queer viewers, disappointment, and the larger scale of people calling queer interpretations of shows and media delusional. While I think a queer interpretation of Merlin is sound, especially considering the whole magic is a metaphor for being LGBT thing, the creators haven't exactly said that magic is a metaphor. They're not quick to deny it either. An article by Hypable comments on the creators' thoughts on the metaphor, but also the reluctance of the actors to agree with them. Their jokes and the commentary largely revolve around the idea that magic and the magic reveal is a metaphor for homosexuality. An idea which Merlin fans had been throwing around for years, and we were therefore surprised to hear the way in which McGrath and Murphy address it. Murphy says things like, On no level is magic metaphorical in this show. To which McGrath will respond, It's funny, I don't actually feel like you're being sincere. This leaves us to wonder to what extent they were, in fact, making these metaphors on a more conscious level than perhaps the average viewer who wasn't necessarily looking for the subtext, might have assumed. The Hypable article also points out the tendency for the creators to joke around with the idea, and it's the small things like this Amazon ad for the show that makes us question it a little more. But however way you look at it, this show is driven by one thing, the relationship between Merlin and Arthur. Their emotions, devotion, and support to each other in life and death beginning to end the show is about the devotion between these two men. To deny that a queer reading isn't a possible reading is to deny the interpretations of thousands of viewers. Maybe they were great friends. But it is just as valid to say that they were in love. In a world where the media says that it only takes a glance for a man and a woman to fall in love, why is it so hard to accept that queer readings are more than expected? Even besides the Merthyr relationship, the dynamic of the show, its allegorical depictions of magic to an almost obvious degree, just calls for a queer reading. From Morgana's self-hatred to Mordred's declaration, this show speaks to queer people, on a romantic and even a personal level. And to deny them that, well, that's the real tragedy here. In the end, Merlin and Arthur. Are they gay, bisexual, pansexual, in love, or something else? You decide. Thank you.